All right, welcome back biology students. We are moving right on through our evolution unit. This is lesson four. So if you haven't watched the previous three lessons, make sure that you hop over um, to the YouTube channel and find those and watch those before joining us for our evidence of evolution lesson. So if you are in class with us today, uh, we are doing like a little introduction activity where we look at images of six different organisms at three different stages early in their development. And we attempted to guess which organisms we were looking at the embryos for, which was pretty difficult because all of the em embryos look the same at their earliest stages of development. But this is exactly what scientists say provides evidence that organisms, these organisms share a distant common ancestor. So in this lesson, we're beginning to bridge uh, genetics with evolution. And we're gonna be pulling from some of our previous knowledge of genes throughout, really throughout the remainder of this unit. So genetic inheritance was not known during Darwin's time. Uh, however, Darwin believed that all organisms shared a common ancestor. And in his travels and studies, he collected really strong evidence to support his theories. And some of this evidence we still use today, like fossil evidence. So today we're going to move through some different fields of biology, which provide strong evidence for some of the theories of evolution that we've been talking about throughout this unit. All right, so we're gonna start with embryology, which is what our little introduction activity was about. And embryology is the study of embryos and their development. So one of the things that Darwin noticed were that embryos of different species may have looked or do look very similar early in their earliest stages of development, while of course, late in their development, they look very different from one another. And so this idea that embryos look similar early on suggests that they must share a common ancestor. So we can see here uh, the chicken and the mouse and the lizard, while they look very different from one another, if you go all the way back to the way their embryos look early early in their development, you'll notice that they all have gill slits, they all have tails, um, that they must share a common ancestor. So the similar features of embryos in very different organisms, again, suggest evolution from a distant common ancestor. So we can use something like a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree to sort of sort this out and make sense of all this. Now, I'm not going to explain how this works in this lesson because I have a whole lesson devoted to reading cladograms. Um, but just know that we have different organisms here and we can see through speciation how these different species came to be, but they all share a common ancestor way down here. And how do we know this? How do scientists know this? Well, they look at embryology. So for the chimpanzee and the bear and the lizard, while they might look very different from one another, if you go all the way back to the way their embryos look in the earliest stages of development, you'll notice that there are quite a few similarities. And so scientists just say, hey, this provides evidence that evolution happens. Another evidence of evolution is paleontology. So this is the study of fossils or extinct organisms. Scientists were studying fossils long before Darwin knew, um, or far before Darwin, but and they knew that organisms changed over time. And of course, Darwin used fossils the fossils that he collected to sort of solidify the idea that organisms change over time. And this, again, fossils just provided more evidence for Darwin and other scientists uh, to support what they already knew, which is that species change over time. This gives rise to new species. This is what we call speciation. And all of these living things once shared a common ancestor. And again, this is the idea of descent with modification, which we talked about a few lessons back. Uh, one of the fascinating examples um, of the way evolution works based on paleontology is uh, with modern day whales, which of course are aquatic organisms, but fossil evidence supports the idea that whales descended from hoofed animals. And so you can see here 48 million years ago, um, 
you can see how uh, the the earliest versions of the whale, earliest ancestors, you can see how their hind legs were very useful. And then fossil evidence over time shows how this hind leg um, is no longer needed. And so we have sort of this vestigial structure. We'll talk about that in just a second, what that word means. Um, here is like the leftover remnants of the hind leg in the modern day whale. But scientists say, hey, the, we've collected these transition fossils that show over time how the need for this hind leg uh, in the whale is no longer needed. And so now it's just a vestigial structure. So it's cool how fossil evidence was able to bridge the gap between an organism that existed 48 million years ago and then one um, that exists today. Now, how do we know how old these fossils are? So let me go back one slide. If you'll notice there's ages here. How in the world do we know this? Well, there's a couple different ways. So we have relative dating, which just estimates a fossil's age. And then we have absolute dating or carbon-14 dating, which can actually calculate a fossil's precise age. We also have biogeography, which is used as evidence to support evolution. So during Darwin's travels to the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that plants and animals on islands look similar to species on other islands or on the mainland, but not exactly the same. There was some variation. And so uh, this made him ponder, like, how did this happen? So you have some tortoises on certain islands that have a certain shape in their shell. Um, here you'll notice that the tortoises on Pinta Island have sort of a, like a tinted shell. And so Darwin was able to determine that these tortoises are adapted for their particular location. So their environment sort of drives the traits that they that they have. So biogeography is the study of the distribution of organisms around the world. So why is it that um, organisms wind up where they do? And Darwin hypothesized that organisms from the mainland had migrated to the islands and different islands because they had different food sources and climates and different predators, the organisms had to adapt in order to survive. And so the different environmental conditions favor different traits. We also have something called morphology, which is also known as comparative anatomy. And this is the branch of biology that deals with um, the form of living organisms uh, and with relationships between their structures. So we're actually comparing structural components of organisms. Some of Darwin's best evidence came from this this comparative anatomy of comparing the body parts of different species. And he found that some organisms have body parts that are similar in structure, but they might be used differently. And so a great example of this is like the four limbs of a bat and a dolphin. And what you'll notice here in these pictures is that the bone structure is very similar, but they are used differently from one another. So the bat uses its four limbs, of course, to fly, and then the dolphin's gonna use its four limbs to swim. And so there are three different types of structures that provide evidence for evolution, and we're gonna go through each one of these. So first we have homologous structures, which are structures that are similar in related organisms because they were inherited from a common ancestor. And so while these structures may not have the same function, Today, if you look at the bone structure, the bone structure is strikingly similar in the bat and the whale and the cat and the human. So homologous structures indicate that these organisms share a common ancestor. You can also have analogous structures, which are structures that are similar, um, but these organisms are unrelated. So the structures are similar because they evolved to do the same job, not because they were inherited from a common ancestor. So a good example of this would be like a bird and a bat. Um, they both use their wings to fly, but it doesn't suggest that they shared a common ancestor. We can also have vestigial structures, which are small leftover organs or structures that once had a function in an early ancestor, but no longer needed today. So 
great example of this is a snake. So um, if you look at the bone structure of the snake, there's these little hind legs here and they stick out the back of the snake. If you were to turn a snake over, you would notice these little vestigial legs. Um, so these little tiny hind leg bones are buried in the muscles towards the snake's tail end. And they're vestigial, they're no longer needed, but um, scientists believe that snakes once walked on their hind legs. And so these are just leftover structures. In humans, we have an appendix. Um, and this is just a remnant organ that helped our um, ancestors digest certain plant material. But of course, we no longer need the ability to digest that material. So the appendix no longer serve a function. All right, biochemistry, this is a newer evidence of evolution. Scientists also observe similarities among organisms at the molecular level. So this is where we're gonna to start to tie in some of the things we talked about in our uh, genetics unit. So the fields of genetics and molecular biology have added really strong support to Darwin's theory of natural selection. And so comparisons of DNA and protein se sequences uh, can be used to show evolutionary relationships between different organisms. So the more related two organisms are, the more similar their DNA sequences will be. So here we see like a little short sample of a DNA sequence for a monkey, a hawk, a squirrel, and a frog. And if you'll notice, there's a lot of similarities in the nitrogenous bases and the gene sequence for these organisms. Um, so this suggests that they all share a common ancestor. Now, if I wanted to know which species are most closely related to one another, specifically related to the monkey, then I would have to like physically go in and compare all the nitrogenous bases. And just looking at this little sample here, um, it looks like all but two nitrogenous bases are in common between, um, let's see, between the monkey and the squirrel, it looks like. So it looks like the monkey and the squirrel share a lot of the same nitrogenous bases, of course, except these two and these two differ. Some particular genes are found in many organisms and give evidence that um, they share a very distant common ancestor. This is the case with humans and chimpanzees. And if you're in class today, we're gonna watch this video on YouTube. Um, I highly suggest you take the time to just type this in the YouTube and check it out because it's really fascinating. All right, this ends our lesson for today. So I will see you in the next evolution lesson.